Welcome back, everyone, to Pontos Fathom Press. Uh, this is our Pontos Fathom podcast, episode 72. And today we're talking uh, around the topic of inflection points uh, around the uh, uncovering of sort of hidden paths and double narratives in the breakaway civilization concept. So uh, um, I guess this kind of started out with I watched the first man movie a while back and it got me interested to read the James Hansen Life of Neil Armstrong. And I also was quite uh, impressed by the X-15 program. It was actually something that I liked as a kid, I think before high school, when I probably wanted to be like in a rock band. I probably wanted to be an astronaut as a kid, so this, it goes deep. But I think it's uh, there's something interesting in all of this because it's like the Pilgrims and George Washington and Abe Lincoln kind of story level of cultural... Um, cultural uh, syncretism around like the u.s space program there's a lot of a lot of uh, things point to this and at the same time you get this great concept from richard dolan uh richard dolan the ufologist and uh podcaster and uh, uh super activist in the ufo space but richard dolan coined this term of breakaway civilization so the idea is is there some branching of our technology where um <clears throat> Uh, at some point, maybe the the government has technology way advanced from what the public version is. And this concept is, you know, you could take it all the way back to ancient Egyptians even, right? So I think, um, you know, a lot of this uh, double narrative, let's call it the, the um, uh, double narrative analysis, right? So, so the concept would be like this. Uh, I guess the premise goes something like this. If there was a breakaway civilization, right? So there were, or breakaway technology, let's say. So let's just ground it in this X-15 program. So X-15 program, one of the founding uh, uh, stepping stones that led us to our, our space program, right? You've got test pilots uh, piloting a rocket plane that would leave the atmosphere. Uh, it also broke uh, uh, speed records, some of which I think are still in effect today. Uh, it had to be engineered to fly outside of the atmosphere so it couldn't use incoming oxygen it had to have its own fuel sources so again solving some problems for what is leaving the atmosphere what is atmosphere re-entry what is um, the fuel problem the atmosphere problem how do we have chemical fuel outside of the atmosphere so you've got the x-15 program uh, just as a, a sort of a let's call a space placeholder for this so let's say at some point the x-15 program Publicly, we know it's a test program, and publicly it led to projects like Mercury and Gemini and, and the Apollo missions of NASA. But what if there was a branch in the technology? What if some of that technology um, was also advanced for a different purpose, right? a different means? Okay. So the idea of breakaway civilization is, is that maybe that the government has technology far more advanced like you've always heard this thing. I think even growing up, I remember my dad had worked with IBM for a while. And he used to always say this thing like, oh, yeah, IBM's got things that they haven't gone public yet with. Right. So IBM was his big HAL 9000 era. Right. But then I think if you look at more modern day things, we look at AI like, you know, sometimes when you look at how bad movie scripts have been in the past 10 years, you know, the, the chat GPT, Google Gemini revolution is just the past couple of years. Right. But. So if you go back 10 years, you wonder, was a lot of this stuff already written by rudimentary AI? I can remember playing around with, uh, in one of the publishing books that, uh, one of these books that's out by Nereus, Nereus Media, it's called The Killingworth Bogman. Inside of that, uh, there are a couple of pages of like, you know, sort of, let's call it, um, you know, a generated uh, content in the sense of, uh, making up like Lovecraftian or Edgar Poe or even like Burroughs like letters or um, n fictional narratives that kind of look like um, academic papers, something like this, right? So the concept is that way back when, before there was AI, people were doing things like these generative language uh, uh, rubrics. So they basically would create like a tag language, like a parrot, for example, a sentence must have a subject and a verb, something like this. So then you have a sentence generator, but then you could randomize a sentence generator so that it would have compound subjects, say 10% of the time, compound uh, predicates, 
Um, and then paragraphs have rules, syntactical rules, and then you could inter interweave it with uh, um, topic matter. So what, what actually somebody did was they wrote a postmodern university paper generator. So you could just select some random words to, to seed this process. And they actually got postmodern uh, graduate level papers published uh, that were totally generated by a non-AI kind of it's really more like a, a rubric. It's more like an algorithm than a, an AI concept, right? So even back, and this is probably goes back 20 years ago that, they, that they, ha, they were doing things like this. So the idea here is, you know, maybe there is some kind of concept of technology that's not yet been released. Okay, now, now well, this wouldn't be such a huge surprise, right? Let's just think about there's always R&D, right? There's always research. There's always company secrets, things like this, right? But then there's the release of the real product. So at some point... You have a double narrative, right? And 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 I and I thought like when before we got into Neil Armstrong and and the X15 program, I thought I'd bring up an example of this double narrative, and how it kind of, you know, something that I found curious. So I read this Alan Dulles uh, biography, right? So Alan Dulles, CIA uh, director around the time of Kennedy. Um, this book is pr pretty much paints Alan Dulles as the post-war. Uh, Cold War sort of hero, master of spies, as the cover says. And it really paints him as like, you know, bridging that time between the end of World War II and the fall of the Nazis and then rise of the Cold War and then how this spy craft was essential to U.S. politics. Right? So it really frames it in the most positive light, kind of James Bondish almost in the narrative. I mean, it's a great biography, very really interesting biography, but it does not at all address anything controversial. Right. There's nothing super controversial in this book. Uh, you know, you can and, and, and you can even see unironically there's photos of, uh, you know, Dulles's life, his achievements, his uh, office, uh, his OSS time. OSS then turns into, you know, foreign service. And then finally, look, he's got even a photo in here with JFK. Right. And. I thought one thing that's interesting is because he's also kind of comes up in narratives like Jim Mars Crossfire as perhaps somewhat implicit or at least complicit in the uh, plot that killed Kennedy. I mean, obviously, he's CIA, he's intelligence. There has to be some kind of possibility that he knows something, right? And yet, not really addressed. So if you go through Crossfire, lots of things that paint Dulles as potentially uh, in uh, his own crosshairs of what did he know at least? What did he know? What did he know about this? And, you know, where does Dulles fit in the story? Now, what's interesting is the book does not touch it all, but, but what we're doing now is we're hunting for clues of double, of double narrative, okay? So we're just looking for the clues of the double narrative, right? So, you know, you've got the You've got omissions of anything around the Kennedy assassination. Obviously, it's addressed, but obviously his role as a, as a co-conspirator would never be talked about, right? Some of those concepts come up in the Jim Mars book. But now here's an interesting... You do a little research, right? And you find this interesting passage here inside of um, the Dulles biography where he says... Talks about... Uh, he does talk about the Kennedy assassination. And he mentions the idea of uh, the conspiracy nuts, right? So there's a thing that he talks about the conspiracy nuts. And he says this passage where he says, if only, uh, you know, there's always going to be some kind of fact, right? Uh, after the assassination, some were offended by Dulles's return to public life. Um, in spite of, uh, uh, almost despite JFK loyalists, Dulles would have been a member of an informal panel of foreign policy advisors. Dulles was called upon increasingly to appear on television debate on the host of conspiracy theories that challenged the Warren Commission hearings. So here we go. He joked in private that the conspiracy buffs would have had a field day if they had known a number of strange coincidences that he actually had been in Dallas three weeks before the murder on a book tour to promote his book, The Craft of Intelligence, and that one of Mary Bancroft's childhood friends, 
his wife, had turned out to be the landlady for Marina Oswald, the assassin's Russian-born wife, and that the landlady was a well-known leftist with distant, time to, distant ties to family of Alger Hiss. So he's taken to defend the CIA, blah, blah, blah. But what I thought was interesting about this is, so they uh, unironically, and almost in a stenographic kind of manner, they kind of like, uh, they, uh, they, they telegraph, ha, ha, to the, they, they almost take a stab at the, at the conspiracy theorists. It's like, wait a minute, his wife knew Oswald's landlady? It's almost like they couldn't, the, like they can't help but include it in the biography. But what I just call that kind of little detail is, maybe it's like an inflection point, right? Just this inflection point. Maybe it's innocent. Maybe there's nothing to be seen there, right? And I, I think with a lot of things, a coincidence is a coincidence until there's so many of them that, you know, um, a number of points alone don't make um, a line. But if those points are all in a line, maybe there's another dimension to, the, to, to this inflection, right? So the inflection points of this, I just bring that up as a, as a tool to start talking about what can we learn from First Men, the life of Neil Armstrong, and at the edge of space, the X-15 flight program, of a potential dual narrative in uh, a potential use of breakaway technology. So here's my hypothesis. Let's just come up with a wild hypothesis and let's test our hypothesis not really testing it in an empirical way, but more like testing it in a, in a theater of ideas. I learned this thing about improvisation. Um, people who work in improvisation, you know, a lot of the funny jokes that we see are done through improvisation. So, and, and the concept that they do is, if this, then what else, right? So, you know, imagine there's a guy on a lunch break and the boss calls a meeting and then the guy in the lunch break sort of like, what would he do? You know, and he's sort of, and I think in the gag, he, he hides a hot dog up his sleeve and he's trying to eat the hot dog and pretending he's taking a nap. At, it's just kind of a funny improvisation, it's, it's skit humor, sketch humor, right? So a lot of sketch humor, a lot of improvisation takes the concept of this, uh, if this, then what else? So the idea is, well, if, you know, Dulles is bold enough to joke about coincidences, Get, what about all the other coincidences that's not mentioned that, that Jim Mars filled the whole Crossroads Crossfire book with, right? So let's just kind of go into um, uh, the Neil Armstrong book. First of all, this is a great man. This guy is amazing. This guy is a test pilot. You watch that First Man movie, you're going to want to read this biography too. It's just fantastic. It's a fantastic read, right? Just very interesting. But the double-edged sword of these kind of hero-type stories is there is a sort of weird post-event, what do you do on the tail side of your life? After you go to the moon, what else do you do? Uh, you know, and, and, and listen, let's, let's put aside, like people say we didn't go to the moon, sure, possible. But he couldn't have faked his whole career, right? This guy flew X-15s. He flew in, in, in multiple programs going up to the, uh, the Apollo program. He is an amazing pilot. So we, we can't say everything is wrong, right? Everything can't be a, a fake narrative. But I bet you there is some things at our stage, and we'll kind of go into that. And this is where the double narrative comes up. So again, double narrative in the JFK story is you've got the Alan Dulles spy master, and then there's the secret part of well, what was Alan Dulles's role or knowledge in the JFK assassination, right? Double narrative, right? Neil Armstrong, let's go with the double narrative kind of concept. He really went to the moon, was really an X-15 pilot, but maybe there's some other aspects of it. Right, and let's go. Let's give that same double narrative treatment to the X-15 program. Let's say, like, well, X-15 really was exactly what they're telling us that it was used to test certain things. But, you know, there's always this concept of function spa stacking, function stacking. You know, you fans of the uh, Atomic Habits, maybe, something like this, where, you know, if you're going to go ahead and do an X-15 program to get you to the moon, why not function stack it and also have it, have a branch of that going off to do something else. And then we can say hypothesize what else could there be that they're doing, right? Um, so again, there's another linkage here to Kennedy and that Kennedy was the driving force to getting us to the moon, right? Kennedy wanted to get to the moon. So we've, we have to keep that in mind. Keep that on, keep a bookmark for that one. So X-15 program, first of all, amazing. I talked a little bit about it. It's just the, uh, you know, this rocket plane, uh, if you um, you re read through this book, it's quite amazing. The um, each each flight of the X-15 uh, had a particular mission parameter, right? So you can see that this book 
actually reproduces all the logs. The purpose of each one was, look, velocity buildup, XLR99 systems checkout, um, arrow heating data, stability and control data, thermostructural data, uh, altitude buildup, velocity buildup, etc. cetera, right? Uh, so, so some of the wins, this is from a paper from 1968. Some of the wins of the X-15 program are, are these type of things. Development of the first large restartable man-rated throttleable rocket engine. First application, so it's a human-driven throttle-controlled rocket. Test, check, you know, proof of concept. First application of hypersonic theory and wind tunnel work to an actual flight vehicle. So they took wind tunnel and hypersonic data and they built a craft that could test that data and see what would happen to a plane at hypersonic, um, hypersonic speed with, with the wind effects. Uh, the development of the wedge tail as a solution to hypersonic directional stability problems. Right, so you can see the wedged tail of the, uh, you can see it kind of here. It's quite pronounced. It's an odd looking tail uh, of the uh, X-15 and et cetera. It keeps going on with this. Development of a large supersonic drop tank, aerodynamic controls, pilot's ability to function in a weightless environment. We saw this in the opening uh, scenes of the uh, first man film where Armstrong is, he's not able to get the controls to respond. It's, you know, you see that there's a, um, it, it looks like it's cold in the cockpit, the oxygen's gone, and, and you know, now he's moved over to the, the um, uh, I believe it's the uh, um, uh, thrusters that they had in the wing to, to, move, to move left and, and right, these uh, uh, chemical thrusters. They weren't using oxygen. Okay, so, so we fast forward from the uh, X-15 program, and we'll talk a little bit about the Armstrong, Armstrong's role in this. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is I kind of want to focus as Armstrong, not only as the test pilot, Armstrong, not only as the astronaut, but Armstrong as the spokesman. Right. So like I said, as a kid, I thought Neil Armstrong was cool. I wanted to be an astronaut as a kid. And this is the exact job that this guy was pushed into. Right. So part of his complicitness, because they always say like, well, how does he not just what if the X, for example, let me throw a hypothesis out there. What if the X-15 was being used in a breakaway format? To chase UFOs, right? So you have uh, you have so this is just like say I'm writing a fiction novel. Okay, I'm writing a fiction novel, uh, working on a uh, on, on an upcoming uh, book that will say there's a secret space program inside the X-15 program. Uh, X-15 goes ahead and does test those real parameters uh, to get us closer to uh, manned rocket moon uh, orbital rockets and 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 extraplanetary rockets going to the moon, things like that. So it's all part of the program to gain data and functional um, ability, engineering ability to get a rocket to the moon. Okay, let's just go with that as a concept. But then there's a second concept that we branch off and we say, well, what if there was this, this function stack? What if they said, well, you know, since 1947, there was Roswell. I mean, we have the, uh, we have the um, Invisible College book on the table. You know, we started out to talk, talk about Richard Dolan. So there were UFO encounters. I mean, 1947 classic Roswell. Whether it's real or not, we do see that there's tons of um, uh, UFO-related uh, related kind of activity. So let's just come up with the hypothesis that the breakaway for the X-15 program is, yes, we're, we're using the X-15 to go to the to the moon and collect data on uh, manned rocket powered, controllable rocket powered vehicles. But also, what if we had to chase these UFOs? We don't know what the UFOs are. Let's create a secret version of the X-15 program. We'll have uh, an X-15, as you guys know, the X-15 used to be um, mounted under a B-52, um, a B-52 plane like this. And the X-15 would be st stationed underneath the wing, and then the, the, um, the X-15 would be launched. So B-52 is going to carry quite a bit of fuel. Imagine if we always had a B-52 in orbit with an X-15 around it, and whenever a UFO sighting was, we would drop launch the X-15 and try to chase it and get photos of it. Let's just throw, throw that as a... I want to put this in my fiction novel, okay? Let's just say, okay? So you've got the... You've got the... Uh, uh, the X-15 on scramble alert, mounted on the B-52, 
keep it flying over places where there's UFO hotspot activity. And this is a great way to waste a billion, billions of dollars, right? Government kind of thinking. Let's just go with it, okay? So now, here we have Armstrong, the spokesman, the astronaut, right? So first off, one thing that I thought was very interesting, Armstrong writes the introduction to this X-15 book. And just like the dullest joke in his, in his biography, the Armstrong introduction is so underwhelming. Now, now, if you read First Man and if you watch the film, you can tell that Armstrong is a quite reserved person. He's a private person. He is not a drama queen at all. He is a, uh, he's an engineer. He's a physicist. This guy is super calm. He was a test pilot. So he's flying vehicles that are experimental, that the fastest speed that a human has gone, he's flown vehicles outside of Earth's orbit, and he's, this guy's cool as ice, right? He's got ice water in his veins. So you would expect some kind of reserve in his introduction, but still, from the time of the world flight, a flying machine is produced that no commercial, with a flying machine is produced that has no commercial or military purpose. The 1903 Wright Flyer was such a machine. Indeed, many of the early flying machines were just to investigate an idea or prove a concept. In an airplane, the proof is that is in the flying. Craft built to demonstrate a concept or to pave the way for a commercial or military derivative we termed exper were termed experimental. In some countries, experimental airplanes were so licensed and prohibited from commercial activity. So this thing, whole thing starts out as a caveat of the double narrative, right? It starts out saying, listen... These planes have no value other than experiment. All right? So right off the bat, the first words of the thing, they're like taking a position that says, yeah, it's just experimental. And he kind of goes on, like, he says, well, there's this kind of like there was a need after World War II for rapid delivery. You know, you've got the Bell XS-1, the first uh, uh, faster than supersonic flight, uh, the Douglas X-3, the Northrop X-4, the Bell X-5. The X-2, you know, and then finally the uh, we get up to the X-15 program, right? Uh, X-15 was capable of a speed of 6,000 feet per second and an altitude of 25,000 feet. It was, it was to carry a pilot and a payload of 800 pounds of research instruments and recorders. At the time, it seemed audacious. It had taken half a century for aircraft to reach Mach 2. Now one new design would attempt to triple those achievements. Uh, X-15 will accomplish all its gold. In 199 flights over nearly a decade, it would become the most successful research airplane in history. But there's much more to the story to tell. The X-15 no longer, this is great, this is the anticlimactic part of it. The X-15 no longer carves a giant trajectory over southwest and deserts, no longer plunges earthwards and strides to stop in the dry lake beds of Edwards. The X-15 is a long retired to museum status, a primitive pathfinder in the conquest of space. But history will record its legacy, a large ring of keys for unlocking the mysteries of future flight. Neil Armstrong. Okay, this is a great introduction, right? But I, I found it a little bit like, listen, there's a little bit of excitement there, but a little bit underwhelming. I feel a much different excitement when I think about this X-15 program. Now, let's go into the first man himself, life of Neil Armstrong. I wanted to kind of talk about a couple of places that I flagged here. One of the things I thought that really clued me into this um, idea of um, his, well, his very um, even-keeled type of character, right? And I thought that one thing that was interesting about him is, is that he was able to just go back into these, you know, go from a life, like a near-death experience in, in, in aviation, and then just return to a, another one. I mean, if you look at his Mercury program, his Gemini, those, those all had some issues with uh, the flying of those um, programs, right? Uh, Armstrong had never related his decision to become an astronaut to his uh, to his daughter. Related? Oh, he never related to his his daughter had passed away. Uh, it was hard for his decision for me to make to leave what I was doing. Very much like going to Houston. You don't have to be in a particular program or wear a particular color shirt to find a research question that is interesting. But it, by 1962, Mercury was on its way. Future programs were well designed and the lunar mission was going to become a reality. I decided that if I wanted to get out of the atmosphere fringes and into deep space work, this was the way to go. So he kind of makes this resolve to uh, go take his, um, uh, on the heels of this tragedy of the death of his daughter, take um, a step away from the test pilot world and go into the deep space programs. Space flight uh, 
Armstrong acknowledges space flight was not generally regarded as a realistic objective. It was a bit of pie in the sky. So although we were working towards that end, it was not something we acknowledged much publicly. Not necessarily for fear of ridicule, but probably somewhat. So here you go. Even the idea of a space program was something that they were reticent to publicize, right? So there kind of has the idea here of, <laughs> it's not saying that they lied to the public. It's just saying, well, we, were, we kept things out of the spotlight, right? So interesting, right? Interesting pathology here that even the space program itself, because it was sort of beyond the average person's probably purview, right? At the time. Uh, just some of these quick pictures here of Armstrong uh, as an astronaut, some of these pictures, lunar pictures. And then I will talk a little bit later about Armstrong as a professor, Armstrong as the spokesman, right? And even uh, Armstrong with advertising deals. One thing I thought that was interesting in the film, uh, the first man film, was when the president said you're now like kind of like uh, it, it wasn't not in these exact words but he was like you're like the spokesman of this now right and i think it was lbj right so again now oh so now again the lbj lbj and the jfk story do we have to bring the book back out yeah but yes right so now we've got a, another one so alan dulles um lbj uh one one place to kind of jump in here uh, is, um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about the, you know, obviously there's controversies around the moon, moon landing, uh, but I think less controversial, but even more, well, I don't know if it's less controversial or more, some people saying that the moon landing didn't happen. Let's say the moon landing happened just for the sake of continuity, just for this topic. But the concept here is, um, how did it actually happen? Oh, we're back to President Kennedy again, because President Kennedy, and I'm bringing out onto the table some works by um, Joseph P. Farrell. So as you guys know, Operation Paperclip was one of those operations. So Nazi base of power was not eradicated in World War I. This is the Nazis' post-war plan in space and physics. So if you look at a timeline from Joseph Farrell's book, right, so uh, we have 19, um, 1945, and you know, so we got the end of the World War, we got end of World War II, right? Uh, 1947, we get Roswell, right? But look at 1948, F report, FBI gains reports of Borman's survival in Argentina, uh, Hoover. Uh, investigates so another CIA and the FBI are investigating former uh, technology uh, Third Rikers. Um, Ronald Richter from the Air Force creates a fusion project, something called Zero Point Energy, which could be related to the Brotherhood of the Bell. As you guys know, there was a uh, a experiment, let's say that that was a project. Uh, we're not quite sure what it was, but in the Third Reich, they had some kind of energy device. Uh, some people thought it was a UFO, but it's looking like it's more some kind of zero-point energy device. Maybe it was cold fusion, maybe some kind of resonance experiment. Um, but this was this bell, this kind of thing, and, and it kind of sounds a little bit like um, uh, uh, maybe alternate energy but it has a linkage in with, like, let's say the UFO technology or UFO file or breakaway technology kind of story. So, as we know, like, by the time, um, uh, Kennedy becomes president, that Werner von Braun, Werner von Braun, 1954 to uh, 1960, Werner von Braun allegedly visits and corresponds with German physicist Burkhard Heim whose six-dimensional spin-oriented full quantized theory of space-time was first published in Germany in, in 1954. Heim's research at that period was sponsored by German arms and aerospace firm Messerschmitt uh, Becklebaum. Now an off-pattern that has emerged whenever one encounters an off-the-book physics dealing with rotating systems, like this bell, rotating plasmas, anti-gravity or exotic weapons, one finds a third Riker, former third Riker, around every turn. 
Von Braun's interest in Heim's theory and other processes cannot be detailed here in part and parcel of interest in anomalies he'd encountered at the same time. So this is basically just uh, Farrell saying, hey, Von Braun was also interested in sort of torsion uh, physics, rotating systems, rotating plasmas, exotic physics, and uh, anti-gravity, which all sound like way advanced of the X-15 exploration, right? But the odd thing is Kennedy appoints Werner von Braun as the head of NASA, and he is going to help. There's a great quote with Kennedy asks von Braun about going to the moon. He's, he said, Mr. President, ask us and we'll do it. Right. So May 61, President Kennedy talks about going to the moon. Uh, potentially, Kennedy wanted to co collaborate with the Soviet Union to getting to the moon, but they ended up becoming a, a, a space race. And after he wants to, um, shortly before his assassination, Kennedy quietly proposes to Premier Khrushchev that the United States and Soviet Union cooperate in reaching the moon. Well, this was shut down. Uh, this was shut down. And the space race was born, right? Uh, Kennedy assassinated in November 2363. Then there's uh, the eventual moon landing in uh, 1969. But one thing that's interesting is in 1967, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison initiates his investigation of the Kennedy assassination and quickly uncovers that many former Third Riker connections, including Clay Shaw himself, Clay Shaw of Crossfire fame, uh, Clay Shaw, uh, one of the tried potential conspirators of the assassination uh, uh, investigated by Jim Garrison, he actually interviewed and vetted paperclip Nazi scientists like von Braun of his type to join in U.S. technology programs. All right, so you've got this kind of indictment from, from uh, and, and, and fantastic research from Joseph P. Farrell about uh, the proliferation of uh, technology at any cost, right? which also has some, some ideas of breakaway technology, right? Uh, one thing that's interesting here, though, is uh, when we get to um, when we get to Armstrong as a spokesman, though, now, if you have a, a double story, it means you have to have a double narrative, which means you have to have spokesmen for the narrative, right? So, again, like like. Uh, one of his heroes, one of Armstrong's heroes was Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, you know, flew around the world. So we got to say Armstrong starts out as a test pilot. He, he becomes an astronaut. So really, he really is the guy. But soon he's kind of co-opted into this PR role, right? Like we've got this one passage here, standing on the ground. I never, uh, following the moon landing, Armstrong recalls, I never asked the question about returning to space fight, but I began to believe that I would, wouldn't have another chance. Um, more or less looked down at, uh, probably because all the time I had worked at the field centers, I more or less looked down at Washington jobs as not being in the real world, he said. Private sector opportunities were plentiful. Thinking over, I concluded that the NASA aeronautics job was something I could do. Neil, his wife said that he was, he was not unhappy with the change. He was a pilot, but he was always happier when he was flying. He was not a desk job person. He was really going to be a radical adjustment for him. So here's the, like, the sort of taming of uh, Armstrong, you know. And who knows if that taming doesn't partly have something to do with, you know, I always think that, you know, here's my take on the, on, on the faked moon landing stuff. I just think it wasn't a fake moon landing. I think they just faked the photos, right? I think they faked the photos because they were crappy photos. And they probably exaggerated things to, to keep the press going. I mean, look at these highlights coming out now from AI, like the... Uh, you know, that Google um, chat bot we saw a couple of years ago in 2018, the one that talked and went, mm-hmm, that was staged. Uh, the, some of this Gemini stuff is staged. It's not saying AI. Is like, I, listen, I work in AI, so I, I, I see this stuff all the time. But they try to, because so many companies are invested in it, they need that spokesman to push it to the next level, right? So we rapidly see Armstrong is becoming that exact spokesman for this kind of stuff. 
And also he has to kind of uh, hold the line of um, the astronaut as icon. And just like Armstrong, I mean, just like Lindbergh before him, right? Charles Lindbergh was the um, uh, poster child sort of of the aeronautics, the birth of flight. And this was a guy that inspired uh, Neil to become a, a, a pilot. But, uh, but, you know, as you lead down this way, um, another spiritual cri critic of the godless American space program, uh, an internet document titled Onward Christian Spaceman, a call for Christian leadership of manned space e exploration, calls Christians not only to participate in manned space exploration, but also to command and lead it over the likes of the theologically naive. Uh, one ha wrote, the crew of Apollo 11 were not even high priests. They were altar boys. Stand there, go there, do that, hold this. At best, they were vessels for others to feel the divine grace. We are taught nothing by astronauts, but we can learn from them. The pilgrimage to the moon exposed the limits of the modes of consciousness that it set out to glorify. It exposed the limits of the mode of consciousness. It uncovered that no new world except the one that foolishly attempted to be left behind. Assertions linger that this is great stuff now. Assertions linger that the telephone number connecting President Nixon to Armstrong and Aldrin on the lunar surface was 666 6666, a sign of the Antichrist, as well as ridiculous, uh, equally ridiculous claim that the moon landing was a conspiracy of Freemasons. The evidence that Aldrin carries a Masonic flag with him as his PPK, which Buzz presented upon his return to the Lodge's Sovereign Command Center and the Supreme Council of the World. Now, here's an even nuttier one. Here's another one. I don't know that this one's true. It's even more deeply entrenched is the rumor that Neil Armstrong converted to Islam. For the past three and a half decades, uh, the story goes that as Armstrong walked on the moon, they heard a voice singing in the strange language that they did not understand. Only later on returning to Earth did Armstrong realize what he heard on the lunar surface was the Adhan, the Muslim call to prayer. So allegedly, he converted to Islam. He moved to Lebanon and then sub sub subsequently visited Muslim holy places, including, including the Turkish Mashid where Malcolm X once prayed. The stories of Armstrong's conversion to Islam grew so great that in 1980, not only Armstrong himself, but an official body of the United States government found it necessary to respond. In 1983, the State Department sent the following message. Former space astronaut Neil Armstrong, now in private life, has been the subject of press reports in Egypt, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and perhaps elsewhere, alleging his conversion to Islam. As a result of such reports, Armstrong has received communications from individuals and religious organizations and a feeler from at least government about his possible participation in Islamic activities. While stressing his strong desire not to offend anyone in disrespect, Armstrong has advised departments that reports of his conversion to Islam are inaccurate. And if the Post received queries on this matter, Armstrong requests that they politely but firmly inform querying parties that he is not, reform he is not converted to Islam. Now here we go. What are we talking about here? He's an astronaut. He converted to Islam. Like, it's like an appropriation of him as the salesman. Now they want him to be an astronaut salesman for Islam. Meanwhile, where did the technology go that the X-15 program converted to, right? So again, if we go to another Joseph Farrell book, this one is the, um, this one is in the uh, uh, t Secret Weapons of the Cold War Allied Leaders. Uh, you see in this one that uh, we see that there are a lot of um, uh, telegraphs talking about uh, hidden technologies. For example, there was the bell that we talked about, the, uh, the glocke. The, glocke. Uh, the bell represented something of the very pinnacle of Camera's grisly and super secret SS wonder weapons empire. Cook's book represents not only a publicly accessible information on the bizarre subject, uh, and the equally macabre experimentation that surrounded it and the stringent security that this SS held over it. The following are the salient features of the bell, according to Cook. The bell was reportedly a metallic object. So again, we're talking about, about secret technologies, right? So here we are, the hunt for the zero-point power. Uh, it landed, it looked like the bell, hence the codename to the German, Die Glocke. It was compromised of two counter-rotating cylinders, looking at a substance called Serum 525 by the Germans. Serum 525 was apparently a highly radioactive, purple in color, housed in cylinders which lead lining three centimeters thick. The bell operated high amounts of electrical power in its operation. During its use, it could be, it could be run for approximately one to two minutes, 
giving off strange radiation, electromagnetic, and other unknown field effects. Several scientists died when it was operated. The tests included various parents and animals which decompose into a blackish goo and without normal putrefaction within a few minutes of hours after exposure to the field effect. What the heck? The chamber of the bell was tested with lined ceramic bricks and rubber mats. The mats having been burned after each test. And they washed down everyone who worked on it with brine. And they used inmates from a nearby concentration camp to work during the experiments. Jesus. Uh, scientists all witnessed the work and the bell were murdered by the SS at the end of the war. There's a strange hedge-like structure was constructed by the Germans out of reinforced concrete around the facility where it was tested. So here we go. All kinds of stuff. Then the UFO crash retrievals. They talk about this kind of stuff. Um, a Canadian UFO crash. Um, here's a picture of a bell here. And then some of those documents. Uh, for example, this is a CIA document from 1950, 1952. Talking about German flying saucers falling in Canada. So again, now you start to have this cognitive dissonance here. Again, when you have two stories, you always have a plausible doubt, right? Here's the, uh, here's an A4 rocket, kind of like reminds me of the B2 rocket. Here's a German um, saucer design from 1939, right? So these kind of have that classic UFO design, right? So again, Hidden technology, secret technology. Listen, it, the war technology always will have secrets, right? And, um, you know, so if we go back and look at uh, in this space, how far back does it go? You know, so if you look at something like uh, Be Hail the Pale Horse by William Cooper, he also calls out lots of this UFO breakaway technology. For example, Area 51 is always one of those places that gets called out, Um as a, a ground zero of where this process took place. But I think the greater narrative here isn't about um, just the details of what this breakaway civilization would be, but it's sort of like trying to ground it in a fact, right? So look, just by the exercise that we've done today, what did we kind of conclude? Well, there's double narratives involved, right? Alan Dulles talks about the coincidences but in a joking way in the public thing. So again, the biographer as a supporter of a double narrative. Jim Mars's counter, you know, we have one of the great reasons that comes up in uh, the plots that killed Kennedy is why. Why did they do it? And I think it's as good a plot as any, any uh, that you get from the uh, Joseph Farrell book was that, well, he wanted to go to the moon with the Russians, right? It's clear. 1962-63, Kennedy in discussion with Khrushchev, and potentially this is a place that causes reasons for him to be assassinated. So if we're going to go so far as to assassinate a president who wanted to share the power with the Russians, or you know to go in as a, a as a as an international space program, like an Earth space program as opposed to an American space program, you know. Um, we can see that the deception concept of this, right? So why don't we go back? So if the X-15 could have been used to be a UFO chaser, and if the Nazis, even pre-Roswell, were working on things that were kind of like a UFO technology, we don't really know the real, the truth of what's going on. You know, again, back in the loop, taking another pass through it, this is a great book that kind of takes you to the depths of how misinformed we are on things, right? You've got the Charles Manson murders, and nobody will tell you until Tom O'Neill comes along with his chaos book that the CIA were, were doing a, uh, a, a program infiltrating the hippie movement. Uh, and again, MK Ultra government program scientists were using LSD um, and that perhaps the same CIA operative psychiatrist, LSD experimenter, that... Um, Charles Manson had um, this uh, this uh, psychologist uh, from the CIA had worked with Charles Manson and had also worked with Jack Ruby, right? So this collusions and, uh, and inflection points of cross crossover, right? Right in the X crosshairs. I know we have crossfire. 
we have crosshairs and we have the X program, right? So we have all of this uh, right in front of us. I think um, the last book just putting out there is, you know, Jim Mars in his Rule by Secrecy, he takes this all the way back through history. So it's not only a question of, you know, if, okay, so let's say, where does the breakaway happen? Well, we, we, like, so we posited, well, what if the X-15 was used, you know, to chase UFOs? But then we have, even before the UFO craze, we had uh, Third Rikers building UFO-like tech, secret tech. So let's go back even further. Where are the different branches of this? When, when does it keep branching? You know, if you look at um, Rule by Secrecy, he takes us back through um, everything from uh, of the Theosophical Program, World War I, the French Revolution, the Templars, the Romans, the Egyptians, the Anunnaki, and then it goes all the way back to ancient aliens, right? Uh, if, you know, if you stop along that way with the Rosicrucians, again, double narrative. Rosicrucians produced fake documents of uh, Christian Rosencruz, who probably wasn't a real person. But this character became the focus point of the Rosicrucian philosophy that was trying to evolve the spiritual science of Christianity, evolve their political means. You, know, you, you even look at um, a character like Dr. John D., right? known as a sort of a necromancer, a wizard. He was also the spy master of Queen Elizabeth I, right? So you always see these double narratives, um, and you always see this kind of hidden technology that's not exactly what you think it is. And I think that this is uh, probably a good place to stop it. I mean, so I think, yeah, we, we did a pretty big tour of things. Uh, at the same time, I think you have to ground everything in a, a layer, of, layer of double skepticism. I mean, these books are totally enjoyable. And they're very interesting. And The Life of Neil Armstrong, I think, is a fantastic biography for anyone to read. X-15 Flight Program, even just the public version of it, interesting. I think with a, a discerning mind, though, we have to uh, take it to the next step. Just like with the Alan Dulles biography. I enjoyed the Alan Dulles biography. But, you know, you, you also, when you start thinking about what didn't the biography tell us, right? And this is where you have to, to you know, they used to say read all the newspapers until, until like, a couple of consolidators bought all the newspapers and they all have the same story. At this day and age, um, more than ever, I think you have to consume media very intelligently. Uh, and I think this is one of, the, one of the concepts that has me interested in, in publishing also. So, you know, we've got our uh, bookstore link down below, Cat Two Journals out of Lovecraft's Providence. You can pick that up. This is really where we speculate on some of the things around Lovecraftian lore um, and its potential to be linked with real world concepts. We've also got the Dune saga, saga, Alchemy and Anthroposophy in the Dune Saga. I almost want to say that this book kind of explores, again, science that's not disclosed to us. You know, I think that Herbert's influence by Samuel Butler is one of those interesting things, but there's also Jungian Alchemy and Anthroposophy in here. And then finally, Artificial Psychoanalysis of Desiring Machines. Go check those out in the bookstore. Help to support the channel. Um, thank you all for watching. You can check out our Patreon as well. And um, leave your comments below. What do you think about inflection points um, of the breakaway civilization? Other books that you might want to read. I think I'm going to be going ahead and doing a uh, William Gibson a Neuromancer and uh, John Carter of Mars, like uh, fiction that's no longer filmable. Uh, I might be, might be doing that, but it's because the age has already been saturated by its influence. So I thought that was a topic I'd like to bring up. But you guys, yeah, let me know what you'd like, to, uh, like us to get into. Also working on some other ideas out there. Like I said, actually, this is part of some research for a new book as well. Um, if you're interested in the podcast books, go check out the podcast bookstore as well. We've got four volumes of the podcast uh, that will help us to grow the channel. And thank you guys for your support. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.